At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. We give God thanks for these holy scriptures. Good morning, Trinity. It's good to see you this morning. Have you developed a theme? Have you noticed it? It's about children. Scripture's about children. Back to school blessing about children. Children are the most important things <clears throat> as far as parents are concerned is the gifts from God. We're also, just let you know, we've developed a partnership with YMCA. We're hosting a number of events this fall. We'll have a soccer teams that are playing. About 450 kids and their families are going to come to Trinity. We're going to pass out water bottles. We'll let you know ahead of time. We'd love for you to come out and just welcome them as good people who will host the event, but more importantly, build some relationships with families in our community to allow them to come and be a part of us and to invite them to do that as well. As the announcement said, so many good things are happening as we kick off in the fall. We certainly want and pray that you'll be a part of it as well. Let's just bow our heads if we could. God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. All right, let's start with an old saying. Every single one of you should know this. I'm going to start with the first line, and then I want to see if you can finish the next line. Are you ready? Sticks and stones will break my bones. Very good. What a load of nonsense that is, isn't it? I mean, think about that. Just words will never hurt me. You and I have been the recipient of words that have actually cut pretty deep, maybe even greater any kind of physical pain you'd ever feel because you can physically heal, but words have a way of staying with you. Words are really important. They matter a great deal. What we say, what we don't say, what we refuse to say, the words that we choose, the words that we use, those things matter greatly. And I think sometimes we take it for granted. We've all been on the receiving end of something that has hurt us so deeply. We've also been the receivers of people who have loved us and encouraged us with the spoken word to build us up, believing the best inside of us. comes down to a choice. You and I every single day make a choice. We can use words to build up or to tear down, to viscerate or to edify, to heal or to hurt. It's our choice. Literally, we make the choice on how we're going to use the words that we have. So we've been talking these last several weeks about the importance of words, in particular letters, which is an ancient art, maybe even a lost art to some degree, about writing letters to people who have made an impact in our lives, writing letters to our parents, writing letters to those who are no longer with us, writing letters to a good friend who's helped change our lives, to mentors, all those kinds of things. Today we're talking about writing a letter to our own children, because we know the value of letters. And in fact, most of the New Testament is a compilation of letters written by Paul. We don't know a whole lot about Paul's day-to-day -day conversations. We don't know a whole lot about his personal life other than what's shared in the text themselves. What we have though, for the better part of 2000 years, are letters that people have collected, preserved, and offered over and over again to congregations throughout the generations. These are letters written down, thoughts, prayers, hopes, and dreams for a congregation. I think writing, as you know, has become a lost art. We're living in this social media age where it's just all temporary. You put out Facebook, you put out emojis, email, all those things. I heard of the thing the other day, it was called a fleet. Have you heard of this tweet, a fleet? Fleet is actually designed to disappear in 24 hours. It just disappears. So a lot of things that's being written today isn't going to be preserved 20 or 30 years from now. And that's the value of a written letter, carefully thought out, well-worded, 
pouring one's heart out on a page to be preserved for all time. So we're talking about writing a letter to our children. And if you've never thought about that, I want to encourage you to do that for a lot of good reasons. I know you won't regret it. I also think it'll change people's lives. I believe in it that deeply. Because I don't care if you're five years old or 50 years old, every one of us has parents. Every one of us feels like there's a child inside of us that longs to have the love and approval of our parents. And every child grows up wanting that. Jesus affirms it by gathering children around him. When all the adults are trying to get the kids to be quiet, not to disturb him, he's saying, that's the kingdom of God. You won't get any closer to God than you would when you're in the midst of a child. But he not only gathers them around, he blesses them to remind them how sacred their lives are, to remind the parents of this obligation and responsibility they have to help raise them up, to give them everything that he and they need to teach them about God. Letters are incredibly important because they have a sense of permanence to them. And this sort of temporary, ethereal life that we have, to have something that we can refer back to. Years and years ago, Stephen Covey talked about, in one of the introductions to his book, said, I want you to imagine a scenario. You suddenly look up and you're in a room full of people and you recognize them because most of them are friends and family and you're looking around, you're not really sure what's going on, but everything seems familiar, but something seems out of place and odd. You look up to the front, there's a casket, and then you realize you're at a funeral. And as you walk toward the open casket, you look down, and lying in the casket is you. And then he says, go back and sit down in the chair and listen to what people say. What do they say about you and the way in which you lived, the choices that you made, the lessons that you taught, the memories that you left behind? What is it that they've said about you? More importantly, what is it that you want them to say about you? And that's your legacy. That's what you leave behind. And really, the truth is we all leave a legacy. We all leave something behind. The only question is, are we going to leave a legacy that we feel is valuable, It's important? Are we going to leave a legacy of pain and chaos or of peace? and goodness because whether you know you know it or not you realize that every single child inherits part of your dna they're just a part of you even if they're adopted they just take on some characteristics because we're the template for the model to show them certain ways about how to live and so kids will automatically sort of gravitate toward that and they see in us the very best in us but they also carry with them the very worst in us we're imperfect we're flawed people and some of our flaws are carried to the next generation. It just happens. We inherited some of the imperfections of our own parents. We're going to pass those on to our kids. And it just happens, sadly. There's no per parent that I know is perfect. I think I've shared with some of you that Jim Sundberg, who used to be a catcher for the Texas Rangers, played 16 seasons of Major League Baseball, talked about his father who was overbearing and demanding and it was never good enough. And one day, I mean, he was an incredibly gifted baseball player, had all the accolades, was all-star at every level. One day he goes three for four and he came out and his dad said, you, you should have gone four for four if you'd have just known what was coming to you at that time. And he said, I walked away feeling I was never gonna be good enough. Every parent injects things upon our kids that we don't always intentionally want to do or need to do. But if we're going to also tell the truth, we also ought to have grace, which meaning our parents weren't perfect, which means we're not going to be perfect, which means our kids, when they become parents, they're not going to be perfect either. But the Bible also says some of the most imperfect, flawed people do the most incredible things. And we come to some peace to say, I think most parents have done the best they possibly could, made some mistakes, of course, but the good so far outweighs whatever it is they couldn't do or wasn't able to do at the moment they tried the best they could. So Jesus gathers little children, statement. And again, Paul says everything is a statement, meaning we're actually letters, letters to people, not written on stone, but on the human heart. Somebody's going to read us. Somebody's going to tell us what do we believe, what do we say, the choices, the words we use, and the actions we take. So all you have to do is realize this little word being blessed is just throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus follows this long-time tradition of gathering children around them and literally blessing them to remind them how much God loves them and how much everybody around them loves them. It starts in the book of Genesis. There's over 400 references in the Old Testament to the word blessed. Genesis says, so God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing which the water teems and every winged bird 
And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them. Over and over again, whatever God loves, God blesses. It's an act of grace. And when you realize just how important it is because it's repeated over and over again, it's trying to tell you that when children grow up feeling blessed, they turn out to bless other people's lives. If people feel empty, unloved, unblessed, they're going to do great harm to themselves, to everyone around because there's going to be a hole in their heart. And every time they're going to try to fill the hole in the heart, if it doesn't come without the blessings of a parent or God or something that really will complete them, then it's just going to be chasing an empty dream and an empty place. The story in the Bible that we always refer to as Jacob and Esau, it's a classic story of people who were born the same time Jacob and Esau. Esau, just by hair, is the oldest. He gets all the blessings of his father. He inherits all the land. He gets everything. Jacob, the younger, gets nothing. And what Jacob desperately wants is the blessings of his father. He's willing to even lie about it to the point where his father can't see anything. And he tries to pretend that he's his brother Esau. His father even says, who are you? And he lies, I'm Esau, trying to steal this blessing that he feels so desperately he longs for. And the whole story goes on for years and years, for a better part of 20 years, that he gets continually lies to people, manipulates, uses them, whatever he can, because he has this hole. He never has the blessing that he wants. And at the end of the story, on a dark night when his brother Esau is with 400 men ready to come, he thinks to kill him, take revenge on him for all the damage he's done. He wrestles with his shadowy figure. Remember the story? It's a great story. We don't really know exactly. Is it an angel of God? Is it God himself? Who is it? But they're wrestling, and it's dark, and all the way until daybreak, and they're wrestling. And you remember what he says? I will not let you go until you bless me. And in the moment that he does, because 20 years later he's asked who he is, and he lies about it. now who he is. He's given a new name, a new identity, and a fresh start. And his hip is broken because he's wrestled with him, but he limps away feeling as whole and complete as he's ever felt in his life because he's blessed, because he knows who he is. And he walks across the river and he reconciles with his brother because he finally receives the blessing that the world never could offer him in the way in which he needed it. So what does Jesus say over and over again? The kingdom of God is within you. If you only knew the power that you have, Jesus is telling us, we've got so much power. If we only knew the power of our own words and actions, we'd do things differently. We'd never take it for granted. We'd be more intentional about it, that you have the power to take somebody's life and to offer grace and love, redemption, everything in the world. You have this power to love people who think they're unlovable. You have the power to change people's lives, to feed a hungry stomach, to build up somebody who thinks the world has forgotten about them. You have the power to build up people. Sadly, you also have the power to tear down people, and it's a choice you and I make every single day. In ancient language, there was a way in which people would define what to say and when to say. It's called the three gates. I always love this. It said, before you ever speak a word, imagine yourself passing through three gates. And at the first gate, you simply ask yourself, is what I'm about to say, is it true? When you go to the second gate, the question is, is this really necessary? And the third gate that you get through is finally a question, is this kind and if you can't answer those in the affirmative, then don't say it. Contrast that with this world right now and the incredible conversations that are happening that are so toxic that if we just stopped and said, is what we're saying true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Is it going to help anything? Is it going to build up or is it going to tear down? Is it going to move the kingdom forward? Is it going to set people backwards? And we are so flippant with the words that we use as if they have no meaning, but they have the power to destroy lives. And there's an ugliness to the conversations that are taking place. You and I have a choice. And part of what defines us are the choices we make. The, cho the chosen, in fact, are made by the choices we make as well. So I want you to imagine, I got bad news for you. One of these days, you and I aren't going to be here. I know that's a shock to some of you. You think you're going to live forever. You're not. There's going to be a day when you're not going to be here. There's going to be a day when everything that you've done in your life is now in the rearview mirror, and you will depart and leave this world. But you're also going to leave a part of you behind for your own children. 
So I want you to imagine years from now, because I've done this, you're going to go through a box, or your kid's going to go through a box, and they're going to find again a letter that they've held on to since the day you wrote it. I talk to parents all the time. Everybody has this little box or a drawer or something, and it contains the letters, and it contains notes. It contains the things that you never want to let go of. You couldn't possibly throw away. You've kept it. And you want to share it and give it, and sometime your child is going to look through a letter, and they're going to open it up, and then they're going to read it and remember what you wrote and who you were and how much you loved them. So Stephen Covey says, start with the end in mind and work your way back. So start with the premise that you're not going to be here anymore and work back. What do you want your kids to know about you? What do you want to tell them and remind them over and over again when so often in life we tend to forget who we are. We lose our way and our parents have a way of reminding us, no, this is who you are. This is why God brought you into this world. I know you. I know every part of you, every fiber of you. So if you actually decide to write a letter to your son or daughter, and I would encourage you to do so. I think it's the most incredible gift you can give. What do you say to them? You say over and again, you love them. You don't start out with qualifiers. You just say, I love you more than you could possibly know. And you just begin to affirm how much you love them. You remember the time that you held them in your arms for the very first time, and that feeling that overwhelmed you, that you couldn't imagine anything more beautiful than what God gave you in that moment, and you share with them the feeling that you had. You tell them how sacred they are and how grateful that you are. You tell them the incredible privilege it's been to be their guide, their mentor, their mother, their father. You acknowledge also that they weren't perfect, and you're not perfect, and we all know that. But even despite all that, there's so much love in the midst of it. And you also just remind them they're a gift from God. They're not an accident. They're not just some sort of happen chance. No, it's you're a gift from God. There's a reason why you came to this world. There was a plan that God had for you in your life. And if you look to him, God, and you lean on him, he'll order your steps and take you into the abundance. He'll actually allow you to see why you were brought into this world. You'll find the gifts that God gave you to make this a better world to touch and transform the hearts of people. And when you write the letter, tell them about your own faith and be honest. Tell them you've struggled with it mightily. You've worked through it and grown, but you were honest enough. And at the end, you came out even a stronger and deeper in your own faith and the goodness and the belief how incredibly good God has been. And then finally, somewhere in the letter, just bless them. Tell them you love them unconditionally, that there's nothing they could ever do that would ever cause them to disappoint you to the degree you wouldn't love them. It would mean that you would love them and there's nothing. It's an unbreakable bond. You tell them and you bless them. You tell them how much they are loved. Tell them in Christ all things are possible and whatever struggles they're going to go through and they will, they're never going to be alone because God will always be with them. And if you're a parent and you've never tempted to write a letter like this, I want to remind you there's already been a letter written to you. So in the Bible, God's often referred to as a parent, like a mother who loves a nursing child, like a hen who gathers around little chicks, like a father who runs out on the road to embrace and hug a prodigal son who comes back home again. And so this notion, this idea, the concept that God is not this distant, abstract idea, it's like a father, like a mother, like a parent. Meaning God's already written a letter to you, to me, to all of us. And if you're looking for a template, I want you just to watch this as we go through this. And I want you to show you this scripture. And it shows you from the very beginning you came into this world, from the day you leave this world, what a parent is, what God is. Take it and take the best of it when you write the letter to your own child. So I want to show you this. Here's the letter already written to you. You're a child of God. This is a love letter from God to you. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up, I'm familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. For you were made in my image. You are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I'm familiar with you in all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. You are my offspring. I knew you before you were conceived. I knew you, chose you when I planned creation. You're not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. 
You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb. I brought you forth on the day you were born. I'm not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it's my desire to lavish my love on you. Simply because you're my child, I am your father. And every good gift that you receive comes from my hand. For I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope. Because I love you with an everlasting love. I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you. You are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. And if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I'm able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. When you're brokenhearted, I'm close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I've carried you close to my heart. And one day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And I'll take away all the pain you've ever suffered on this earth. I'm your father and love you even as I have loved my son Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I love that I might gain your love. And if you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I'm waiting for you. Love your dad, almighty God. We are blessed to bless others. Now go bless the child that God blessed you with.